Hey, welcome to the Tone Pot. Today we got Jesse Magana, a local Vegas guitar legend. Mm. Um, why don't you just tell a little bit about yourself and what bands you're currently um, playing in? Okay. My main project is a local, like, hardcore punk band called Hard Pipe Hitters. I also play with kind of a more, I guess, like, radio-friendly pop punk band called The Sprockets. And then um, here and there, I'll play some tunes with artists in town like Cat Calling and uh, anybody else who might just need a guitar player. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely uh, seen you out and about. I've known you for a long time. We have played music before. And I have seen you play a lot of guitars in the time that I've known you. Strats, Atelli, mm. SGs for a good hot minute. I know you got your custom guitar right now. Right. But out of all the guitars that you have had the privilege of jamming on, what are some of your favorites? Oh, man. Favorites. That's, that's, that's crazy because... There was actually a period, too, when one of the bands, one of my previous bands, One Pin Short. Yeah. Shout out One Pin Short. Go check out One Pin Short if you guys are into any uh, reggae it, I don't or think ska can. music. Um, go do a deep dive, and let's get this shit circulating again. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a time when we had access to, like, a Gibson, I guess, baby artist sponsorship. Yeah. It was, it I was, remember that. It was basically a program that Gibson had where they would reach out to kind of up-and-coming artists and allow them to use Gibson guitars and basses and kind of check them in and out for no cost at all Yeah, just to be part of their shows. And, you know, if we did anything on TV or going on tour, we could stop at a Gibson showroom if we needed a guitar for a gig. And so that throws that question of favorite guitar into like a really hard to answer category because yeah, there anything. was a short period of time where I was playing just whatever I get my hands on because it looked cool and it was in the Gibson showroom and I could grab it. I want to hear about I, all that. I scratched a gold top, mm, which was fun. Juicy. And probably towards the end of us having that sponsorship. I'm sure we all have our stories yeah. of gear destruction. Um, but so uh, one of the guitars that stands out during that time was one of the guitars that ironically enough, I, I, I played during that era i guess of having the little baby sponsorship but that wasn't a gibson guitar so it was something that was like kind of playing in secret or in shows where i was just like don't take a picture of me you know what i mean yeah because uh, i knew i would get in trouble uh and that was a like cherry red tex-mex telecaster mm -hmm. i remember that one that have the three pickups the three pickups yeah. the third pickup the nashville telly or something i think i think yeah. it was a nashville telly yeah i yeah. remember that and i was playing it in Wimp and Short, which was primarily a reggae band at the time. And I, I would say that playing a Telecaster in a reggae band is maybe not as commonplace or uh, what you would think uh, for a Telecaster guitar. You yeah. Know what I mean, I mean, Telecaster is kind of the iconic. Vibes and stuff, you know, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe trend, one. yeah. But I mean, yeah. or, you know, when you think of Telecaster, you think country. You think. For sure. You know what I mean? Like. You may want a thicker bucker for. Uh, yeah, yeah. Chicken yeah. picking and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, and, and playing that guitar during that band on, I think primarily I was playing on like a, a, a vintage 30, mm -hmm. one of those PV. PV Classic 30s. Yeah, PV Classic kind of, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I definitely, those are fucking great amps. Yeah, I still have They're it. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I also had a little, it was a little combo, and I also had a little crate 25, 30 watt little tube amp. Uh -huh. um, but I think the, that PV Classic 30 was what I was playing. And again, you know, it was, you know, reggae rock, and we had a lot of going from clean to distortion. So you would, you would think that playing just with a classic 30 and the foot switch that it came with, and a Telecaster, if you saw that rig, a Tex-Mex Telecaster at that, yeah. you wouldn't say, like, oh, this guy's a, 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 in a reggae band. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, man, the... the TV Ray Vaughn vibes or yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the old bluesy just, like, rig, you know? Mm -hmm. And the responsiveness that I got out of that guitar coming out of that little combo tube amp was one of my favorite setups that I've ever played on because my clean tone was just so fat and so dynamic. Like I could control the volume and, and the grit and, and adding a little bit of distortion or none at all just based on how heavy I was playing. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. And it was, you know, a, a lot more dynamic control than you see a lot in, in that like kind of new age reggae rock genre where it's just like either a clean guitar with some delay or 
you know, uh, a heavy distortion and it's switching back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and it didn't fit either one of those categories, but it made for, it didn't, but it did. Yeah. It, it made for yeah. a fantastic <laughs> tone. Um, and a lot of, you know, I got a lot of comments on it. People saying like, man, that clean tone was just heavy and fat. And also, you know, it's one of those things that I do that, um, especially with that guitar that a lot of people don't, especially in like the reggae and ska world is, is play almost primarily in the clean with the neck pickup. Yes. I wanted to touch on that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah you um, have the fastest hands out of anyone I've ever seen, dude. <laughs> uh, rhythm wise. Yeah. Um, playing fast ska and, 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 or like having a lot of, you know, flair on the reggae side with the clean stuff. I, I feel like, and even in punk rock, you know, like when it's primarily through the bridge pickup clean, mm -hmm. that's just not the sound for me. Yeah, for sure. I know. Like, you know? it's so crazy because so many different players have their like ideas of the, and I might gravitate the other way, you know, like more thin and choppy. And uh, I, I love the, again, like you said, the fat roundness um, that you can get from all of your sounds. It's like, it, it totally fills a room. It's fantastic. Yeah. And like, particularly, um, with that pickup switching, like something like in like hard pipe hitters, if you were to take one of the faster ska core type songs, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, everything's going probably, you know, 200 BPMs, rapid fire hits, strumming like hell, and still being able to step on that pedal while you hit the toggle switch with your hand to yeah. switch the channels and the pickups all at the same time in the midst of controlled chaos it's right yeah yeah, yeah. that's and and that goes to show you just how cemented in this you know idea of tone that i have when it comes to playing clean or playing um distortion especially in a band like that you go from super heavy fast palm muted 16th notes uh 200 bpms straight to super fast ska core kind of stuff totally and and yeah and i have to make sure because i'm that particular mm -hmm. that as soon as the foot goes down to switch the channel i'm just mid swing mm -hmm. slapping the pickup selector yeah. you know what i mean to get it over to the neck pickup as soon as i hit the clean because i want that fat kind of low end you know, tone to, to, to support that picking, that ska picking, because I think it's missing in a lot of just like what you think of just ska, you know, or even punk ska, like old Ivy stuff. Yeah. Operation Ivy. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I remember going back and listening and one being like, this guitar tone is fucking terrible. I love it. But, and like that was mm -hmm. definitely, I think, like a single coil guitar. Um, on the, some strat type guitar, I'm fine. That, that Tim used, yeah. Could I, guess, yeah, I, for I, sure. I think, I mean, I know he in Rancid, he, he could used be wrong like the, for sure. The semi hollow bodies, yeah, definitely rocking the buckers. And before that, it was like, um, but you SGs can hear, flipped upside down. I think, stuff, I think, like, yeah. how I remember it hearing Op Ivy is like that old single coil clean uh -huh. bridge, a lot of spankiness and clankiness, so much spankiness, yeah. yeah. And, um, I was just like, I wasn't about it, you know what I mean? For sure. I was like, where are my low mids at? Like, I need them, you know. And I, I brought it up to you before, yeah. too. I've been like, hey, how crazy would it be as an idea or to pull off if we were to make some sort of a wiring thing going on in my guitar where I could maybe have some sort of TRS cable that would switch a my pickup selection. Of your pickup you know what I mean? Yeah, that would dynamically sure. actually switch the pickups as I'm switching the channels. That takes all the fun out of watching you play, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's all, uh, yeah. yeah, doing the crazy yeah. hand thing to slap it. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's awesome, man. What are like... Um, what made you want to like pick up a guitar in the first place? What did you hear or see that made you say like, I want to play guitar? So, I mean, it starts musically, uh, genre wise and, you know, being introduced to the instrument with classic rock, specifically Sabbath and Santana and, mm -hmm. and Zeppelin, um, which I have my mm -hmm. mom to thank for that. Uh, so thank you, mom. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, mama. Magani. Cause I, I remember, uh, and actually green day oh, because no, no when doubt, we were dude. 12 years old, I mean, that was what? 2000, one you know what i mean yeah and so green day was all over the radio you know for sure I mean? uh, when i come around and stuff like that pre-american um, idiot before the mass bro yeah up, man, and i remember one of the first a ticket one of the first birthday <laughs> gifts i ever got from a friend as a child i think i was 11 years old or something was dookie and so at the time it was driving home from school with my mom in the van and her having comp radio station on and, mm -hmm. you know, me telling my mom, turn it up. Like, I like this. And it was probably Zeppelin or Santana. She's like, oh, you like this? Well, let me tell you something. And we got home and she came downstairs with, you know, a Santana record and a Sabbath record yeah. and Zeppelin. And she was like, this 
is what I grew up with. And that sparked it at, as far as musically, because I had picked up the saxophone first. Oh, shit. Before the guitar. My instrument, you know, I really liked the trumpet and the saxophone and like brass instruments as a kid. And that whole concept of just like being loud and in your face. And it wasn't until listening to those bands that I mentioned and then being introduced to that style of music, uh, which led to the first show that I ever went to with my best friend's older sister and her friends. Uh, they took us to the Pop Disaster Tour. Yeah, Blink-182, Blink, Jimmy Eat World. Jimmy Eat World and Green Day. Yeah. You know what I mean? So Green Day and Blink were co-headlining, uh, I think is how it went, and Jimmy Eat World was the opener. And um, I remember going to the show, being familiar because... I had heard Green Day on the radio, and my best friend was into Blink, and one of the first CDs I ever received was Dookie, and yeah. so that was on repeat as a kid, and then I went to that tour, to that show, and Green Day went in, like you know to the crowd and were like, who plays guitar? Yeah. And I'll never forget, like they just pulled up three dudes from the audience. So cool, man. And the dude who got to come play guitar, I, I want to say, and, and my memory might just be playing tricks on me and like melding a bunch of memories together, but I think... It was like this dude with a crazy red mohawk and like a blue denim vest. And I remember him going, I was like, okay, if that kid who looks like, you know, my friends. All these kids. Yeah, my, yeah, my <laughs> friend's sisters, you know, kind of older friends, like in like the kids in junior high and stuff. Yeah. Like that That's the kid. Like that's my friend group. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if that guy can go up on stage and play in front of 50,000 people, like then I can do that. And yeah, I, so I got to learn the guitar. You know what I mean? So I picked up... Uh, guitar as an instrument and you know then got into a lot of trouble that yeah decision. for sure yeah all downhill from there right yeah definitely yeah so um we talked about some of those cool guitars you got to play but you have recently kind of like made your own guitar mm -hmm. what led you to that and what were the specs that you were looking for um to create that beast well uh for starters at the time I was playing in a, in a band called Be Like Max, um, as well as all the other projects mm -hmm. that I play with here in town. Um, and they're a fantastic band. You should definitely look up that band's uh, catalog, even though um, we're not currently playing anymore. Yeah, shout out Be Like Max, Las Vegas, Scott. Um, and the SG, which was my workhorse mm -hmm. for the better part of a decade at the time, even though I was relatively happy with the kind of different pickups I had put on it and um, the amp that I was using, et cetera, um, I had gotten to a point where, and it's funny that we, we talked about that Telecaster earlier, yeah. because I got into a point where I wasn't just playing like ska core, like with hard pipe hitters, where it was just like kind of dirty, fast ska. There was also a lot of kind of slow or even just, you know, regular pace pick it up ska kind yeah of absolutely stuff would, would be like max mm -hmm. and all of a sudden i realized you know i remembered being in one pin short and having that telecaster and having a single coil sound yeah when i was playing clean mm -hmm. and thinking man the humbucker in my sg right now which was uh in the neck i was using a uh, seymour duncan jazz jazz okay yeah jeff beck in the bridge mm -hmm. seymour duncan jazz in the neck which sounded fantastic as a combination but that Seymour Duncan jazz in the neck on my SG was getting me a pretty, I don't want to say bland. It was very full uh, and rich low end kind of, you know what yeah. I mean? Sound, but it was not giving me enough character on holding down the rhythm of just some kind of slow skanks. There is a sparkle to you know? a single coil pickup right. that um, just can't really, you can't count even with a tapped, a uh, humbucker, you know, or, totally, so split 100, 100%, or something like that. There is yeah. a sparkle that just can't be captured with a humbucker. And you using it in the neck position, like the neck position on a strat or, you know, those three pickup tellies, whatever, that's the fucking tone zone, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so one way I, ticket to tone town. I, I, I remember practicing and playing a few shows with Be Like Max and thinking, oh man, like when I'm supposed to be kind of stepping back from just like, you know, kind of aggressive ska and kind of just holding down maybe some more reggae type skanks or whatever. Yeah, more of a background instead of an upfront yeah, aggressive like I kind still, of. Yeah, I uh, still mm -hmm. want to have uh, a little character, a little sparkle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I was like, you know what? This fantastic sounding humbucker in my SG right now is not doing it. And like all guitar players know, when it's time for you to maybe tweak something a little bit, you got to just buy a whole new ship. 
Yeah, you know what I mean? for sure. This is like I, start from scratch and believe me, I know. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's why we have you know rooms yeah. full of stuff that we barely play. Yeah. But um, so I got the bug, I got the fever, and I was like, well, I got to build a whole guitar around this concept now. Yeah, dude. Of needing a single coil in the neck and a good juicy humbucker in the bridge mm-hmm. because I was going to continue doing my little slap in between. Absolutely. Every time I changed from clean to, to dirty, I would be changing my pickups as well. And uh, so I was like, cool, well, I guess it's time to build a guitar. And um, we had spoken about some options of like humbuckers that, you know, or humbucker sized single coils to just throw in the SG or maybe like using one of the strats that I have at the house and putting you know, roundabout solutions. Yeah, you know, you know what I yeah. mean? Like putting a humbucker, a single coil size humbucker in one of the old strats to, to uh, do it that way. But at the end of the day, I was like, no, the, this fever's too strong. It was like COVID yeah, was going so on. So a, like I was project you hungry. Need yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, and um, I was like, uh, yeah, I guess let's build a guitar. And I had been watching videos during certain YouTube rabbit holes during the pandemic. And I was like, mm. I could try to do this. So so I ordered the parts from Warmoth. Yeah. And I got to go a little crazy with picking um, the different woods and stuff. So the specs of the guitar are, a, it's a Strat body. Yeah. What made you go to, to the Strat? Because, I mean, we've known each other a long time, uh, junior high school, guitar class, after school, um, way back. And back then you were playing a Strat-shaped guitar, you know. Probably was a lot of first guitar mm-hmm. shapes for people. The first guitar, Did yeah. that have anything to do with your decision to go back to a Strat shape, or was there other uh, reasons involved for you? I think it was probably a little bit of nostalgia going back to where I had started, which my first electric guitar that my dad bought for me was, I think on like my 13th birthday or something, was a, um, a 20th anniversary choir Strat. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the black on black, the black, yeah, yeah the matte black with the black pick guard, um, dual hummies, dual humbuckers, yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, at the time, that, that so let's really quick sidebar to my first ever rig, yeah. which was that Squire twentieth anniversary black on black uh, Strat with the uh, two humbuckers and a guitar research mini half. Stack. Yeah, boy, I remember that that rig. Like, it was like it was like a it was like a. 410. The Red Rocket. The, yeah, the Red Rocket. Yeah, dude. With like this little head. <laughs> I think it was a 60 watt head. Uh huh. I wish I still had that amp. Dude, they were pretty cool. Because I mean, when cool, you just man. think about that, when you say it out loud as a gay musician, oh, a 410 with a 60 watt small head, it's like, oh, that sounds fantastic. It was like a mini half stack, but it wasn't quite mini though. It was just like a little toned down from like yeah. a big Marshall dog or whatever, right. exactly. you know? Yeah. yeah. And so it was, it wasn't too heavy. It was easy to move around. Um, yeah, that was my first rig. I remember that rig. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Sin City Slackers, dude. That was, uh, <laughs> yeah. You'll never find anything from that, but no. yeah, that's some, <sighs> I don't know. That's some stuff. All right. I you shouldn't, might be you some shouldn't find somewhere. anything yeah, yeah, from don't, that. Yeah. Don't, if you find it. Put it, give it to us in a safe. Well, speaking of rigs, um, what are you rocking currently for your, um, well, let's start. Um, you, you said you play a little bit of acoustic out with some people. I know you just did a gig yesterday mm-hmm. with Cat Calling. Mm-hmm. You're uh, predominantly just rocking the Taylor for all acoustic of your stuff. acoustic yeah, stuff. Yeah, because during the pandemic, I had participated in, and helped organize, actually, like a big like fundraiser and donation type thing for uh, the schools in town that needed mm-hmm. guitars for the Title I students, the, you know what I mean, the low-income students. For sure. And I donated my guitar as part of it to put my money where my mouth is. And you know what? We may be getting back into that at some point. I'm just putting that out there. (laughs) Uh, Donate your guitars to Clark County School District. Do that. But yeah, so I gave my guitar away, which I can't even remember what I was playing. I know there was a Vation that I gave away. I gave away a few That was a quilted... Uh, maple oh. figured Ibanez acoustic. Zebra I don't. Oh, zebra wood. Son of zebra a bitch. Um, yep. I do remember it having a slightly thinner body than your typical dreadnought, but you also had that really cool acoustic um, effect system in there. I remember that yeah. for a period oh, of time. Oh, I had the uh, the tonewood amp. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah inside. Um, that which was fun. I think you might still have my magnet. I believe I do. I'm for gonna, sure. I'm take yeah, that. we'll be talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, so I was playing yeah, that Ibanez, that Zebra Wood Ibanez. I donated that as part of it, and so I was needing an acoustic guitar, and it just so happened that somebody that I knew uh, pretty closely was yeah. able to give me a very good deal. Very cool. Yeah, on a Taylor guitar. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah. and it's got the cutaway, if I do recall correctly. I had to, to have the cutaway. Yeah, yeah, for sure, getting the up there. 
And those um, Taylor preamps, man, they... It sounds so good. It's so it sounds so rich. And for the um, electric stuff, like for the um, sprockets, hard pipe hitters, mm-hmm. um, all the other stuff that you're doing, what is your rig currently? So let's start with the guitar. Like, let's go back to the to the custom yeah for guitar. sure. Because I want to see that guitar yeah. into your pedal so, board, into the amp um, cabs. The, <laughs> yeah, the specs for the guitar that I ordered and then finished myself was a Strat style body mm-hmm. with a universal. And that was a, uh, um, a like a Karina type. Right. Um, so yeah, so the the Strat style body with universal pickup hole. That way I can do any configuration of pickups that I want. Um, the wood is the black limba or black the, limba. Yeah, the, Karina. If Karina. you're a Gibson fan, for right. sure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, Karina or black limba. Uh, mm-hmm. It's got some beautiful stripes on it, and mm-hmm. I, I went with like a vintage lacquer, clear vintage yeah. clear lacquer. Nitrocellulose lacquer. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to make sure that I didn't cover up that beautiful wood grain finished it myself and uh let's see the neck is a koa mm-hmm. wood neck and a i always say this wrong Ma- Ma- makassar masakar me makassar makassar Maca- Maca- yeah it's a, basically the striped ebony striped ebony yeah. fingerboard yes yeah so mm-hmm. um black limba koa uh the striped ebony fingerboard there's all the exotic woods you um, could throw however at that yeah. I, it because i had played on an sg for so long mm-hmm and had gotten so accustomed to that, I didn't want to just completely upend my comfort zone going into new guitar territory. I went with the uh, compound radius 12 to 16 neck, yep. the fingerboard, on a Gibson scale length yeah, neck. absolutely. Because Warmoth has their own That's a 24.75 if yeah. uh, anyone's digging on those numbers. I, I am not, but <laughs> I'm happy someone else did yeah. uh, because uh, Warmoth has their own little proprietary conversion protocol where they can put a Gibson-sized and style neck onto totally. a fender body. And I was like, oh, perfect. As someone who started on a Strat and moved to having the workhorse being an SG for so long and then now building my own, like kind of just melding into things I was familiar with all together. Yeah. And even down to like the three by three headstock, it's like literally looking at that, like a centaur of a guitar, like the top half of an SG. It is a quintessential build your own strat. I don't forget what the term is. But also with a, um, with the wraparound bridge. So you got like a real junior kind of a Gibson vibe on that. Just two posts right into the body. Right. Go into that, you know, shorter scale Gibson scale strat. So, so you got the nostalgia from all your past guitars. A hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's absolutely just like a you know, a big old melting pot of everything that I'm familiar with and liked. And um I went with the single coil on the neck. Uh it's a Lawler. Um I think a dirty blonde. Yeah, boy. Um it's um in the uh bridge I have a humbucker. I think it's the Seymour Duncan what is the, what are the letters? S S five, S H five. S H five. That would be the Duncan custom for sure. It's a fantastic pickup. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I'm a big fan. Um, and that's, that's the guitar. And then I'm going into my beloved Carvin V three M. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's back this up. Oh, you're going to hit a pedal board. Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. You're right. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, uh, I had some fantastic help building the pedal board. Yeah. So, fantastic. Thank you very sure. much. <laughs> So I'm using, I forget the name of the pedal board. The Temple so. Audio Pedal Board. Temple Audio Pedal Board. Um, <laughs> I have uh, a BEOD overdrive pedal from Friedman. Yeah. The dual channel overdrive. For sure. The deluxe. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. I love that. The BEOD mm-hmm. deluxe. I have standard boss tuner. I have my... Uh, Classic. DD5, I think. The, the analog. Yeah. Style. Um, boss delay. Boss delay. Mm-hmm. And then I'm rocking a uh, EQ pedal as more of a boost the, the mxr yeah for sure yeah mxr eq that i like to use as more of a boost they're like a swiss army knife in the rig you know because if you got to go somewhere and you don't get you know that previously there are B3. some fantastic <laughs> youtube videos where you can go and learn about how much you can do with an eq pedal on your pedal board it's insane it's insane for sure yeah, yeah. so of course, I'm using it for kind of the bare minimum, which is just like a little. Well, you got your amp and your, you know, sure. desired rig predominantly. But mm-hmm. hey, if you find yourself in a pickle, you know, but that you got that pedal chain was primarily put together one because I don't really get too crazy into effects, even though I'd like to branch out a little bit. But um, all of that, the EQ. No, I've seen you delay your delay. 
yeah. Okay, so I love playing with the delay. <laughs> Coming from playing in eight years in a reggae band, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I learned in my ins and outs of, of playing with a delay. Yeah. But most of that, uh, the two-channel uh, overdrive, having the EQ as a boost, most of that came from a practical sense from the amp that I use now. Because mm. at the time when I put yeah. the pedal board together, I wasn't using this amp that used to be my old workhorse. And so sure. I built the pedal board to take the place of the functions that I would got from my old amp. That, old amp being the V3M. Right. And then at the time I was using that hundred watt, um, that older Carvin from like the nineties or yeah, eight, I like the hundred watt, the hundred watt, like a big old Carvin head. head but mm -hmm. there was there was something else too that I was using for for a short time, and I I can't recall right now in between. In those. Uh, setting so you were predominantly using those amps as clean tones with that B E O D giving you right. m another two sounds you know on tap essentially right. right which now coming out of the pedal board and going back to the amp that I'm using now which is my old workhorse which is my you know back to the V3M my baby yeah is the Carbon V3M mm -hmm. um, it's one of those like small the M is for mini it's a small yeah. version of their V3 that they had which was a three channel tube amp that can switch from the the M the mini is switched from uh, 50 to 25 yeah which is oh 50 yeah oh fantastic man i love it uh, I've, I'm yeah so, it's the best because the, the v3 was 100 watt yeah for sure the big, big old, doggy big old yeah mm -hmm. but the v3m is a, a 50 watt it can switch to 25 and maybe 12 damn I, no i've, I've I know definitely it seen um you know yeah them kind of tripling down, so to speak, sure, on yeah. uh, wattage options on a lot of modern amplifiers. Mm -hmm. And Carvin was kind of um, up there, you know, with the wattage switching and stuff like that. Like, they always tried to be up on the curve of modern amplifiers and stuff like yeah. that. So and I definitely wouldn't put it I past was, him. yeah, and at the time, Carvin was building great stuff, and I went online and did my own little kind of, you know, due diligence and yeah. wanted something American-made. And, um, man, the, that, that Carvin amp. And I'm so happy that I got it fixed up, which, again... You helped me do. For sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm here for you. Um, because it's a three channels, two the two distortion channels are the same channel. Yeah. Yeah, there's no difference between them, which is fantastic because if you have some preferences on, on how you want to switch your, your your tones a little bit, you can. And for me, having uh, that capability is fantastic. For sure. Especially in a band like Rockets or even uh, Hard Pipe Hitters where like maybe instead of the clean, I'll, I'll have like one of the dirty channels be just broken up enough yeah. to not be a full saturated distortion totally but like a just a dirty version of the clean channel you dig in hard you can you get know? a little or crunch in the or alternative yeah. uh, with the other band sprockets i'll have the second dirty channel be um a little bit of an eq curve cutoff on the highs and lows so it's just kind of mids yeah and a little lower distortion for like intros and stuff sure. that way when i punch into the actual saturation you know the, the really fully distorted you. channel it really comes out yeah you know man mean? Um, kind of give that telephone effect um, for certain parts of bridges and stuff. The only thing I don't like about it is the the, the way that the pedal connects to the amp. Mm -hmm. which MIDI is five pin. A MIDI five pin yeah. cable, which mm -hmm. caused so many problems uh, throughout the years. But we um, good now. We're good now because okay. you helped me fix it. And right. You helped me install like a custom little. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Port. We're good though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're good okay. now. Yeah. yeah. And it has a boost. So on, on, on the little on the pedal, you have a reverb switch for the reverb that's on the amp. You have a channel switcher uh, between all three channels, and you have a boost. So that little amp is just. So you have a, a buffet at your feet. You got three yeah. channels and a boost from your Carvin. Another two sounds you can obtain right. from the BE, and then the Swiss Army of an EQ, which you can use for any applicable. 100. You know, whatever. That's yeah. pretty. And then uh, nice. finally, it's pretty, is, pretty cool. it's pretty sweet. Yeah, pretty, it's, pretty, pretty, I mean, pretty. it meets all my <laughs> needs. You yeah, know what I mean, and, and then so yeah, and then um, I have that. It's it's so good too. The the Carvin two twelve. Yes. Yeah, I know you have um, some preferences on cabs that I wanted to touch yeah. on as well, because I love that about you. Like most people have a pretty like right down the middle factory standard kind of approach. And, you know, I maybe even be one of those guys myself, yeah. but you don't with anything. And I fucking love that, man. Yeah, like yeah. everything, even something like a, even a popular pedal, like the B E O D, I could guarantee you nobody sets it like you do. Like you have a totally well, yeah, different yeah, way. Yeah. Of, one of the channels on my B E O D has the, uh, yeah, the game turn all the way down. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just and you wouldn't think like that with unique, a B-E-O-D. It's yeah, like dirty, a clean fire sound. breather. Right. Yeah, exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah. So I love that. So let's talk about that uh, cab for a second and your preferences regarding those. Right now you got the Carbon. Um, it's a 212 with Celestians. Sure. I think, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think. And you do prefer um, the open back uh, yeah. cabinets, if I recall correctly. Right. Um, as opposed to a closed back. Yep. You know, would you see more like, I guess, uh, in the punk rock and thrash, more of a closed back, but I guess more in the reggae and ska world, open back might be actually a little bit more common now that I uh, maybe yeah think um, about that. But exactly, I think that contributes to the round, full fill a room kind right. of thing 100%. that you achieve. There was there was two huge reasons for going with the open back, and then one kind of just like side thing. And uh, the two big reasons were one, getting a little bit of sound reflection kind of response on a small stage sure because it's you know reflecting off the back and giving me a little bit almost like a like a monitor type feel if i'm just like right up on top of my amp and i can't hear it because it's at my feet blasting you know what i mean into other people's feet it's almost like having a i mean it's not but it's almost like having a portage speaker you just get a little bit more right. yeah. um woof kind of uh, sure, and yeah. you feel it a little there's bit there's a little more bit more too. air moving around on stage all those words you know, that you just say yeah. that yeah, don't exactly. mean anything. Yeah. Um, the other thing, which is has nothing to do with tone at all, was if the back was open, I could put things in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so going on tour Storage. and being like, it's yeah, like, this is where the foot pedal goes and the you know the speaker cable and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the side too, what I noticed is that it lets me have a little bit more control over the low end of my EQ settings on the amp. For sure. Because the the low end um, is kind of breathing out of the amp versus um, hitting the back of the amp and coming back into the microphone and being mic on stage. It, it just hit me that that could be a great tool for the EQ pedal. Like if you ever find yourself having to use like, you know, a standard 1960 Marshall cabinet with a closed back on stage, you might be able to push a little bit more right. low end into your sound and sort of fake that woofiness maybe. Um, I, the, I, I, the opposite. I, I think, I think there's, I think there's more woofiness having the closed back because I think that, like I said, those, those lows are bouncing off the back of the amp and coming out the front. Mm-hmm. It's just forward projection. So, yeah. I, I mm-hmm. think, I think the EQ, if I were using it, like you said, like on a big old Marshall, you know, half stack, like I would probably cut, cut yeah, yeah, okay. the lows a little bit to try to control it. Yeah. If I needed to, you know what I mean? If I needed to. When you, um, I guess this would be part of my next question is basically just like, what are some of the favorite um, recording rigs or guitars mm. that you've gotten to use, and do you use um, open backs in those settings? Are you more close micing it and not preferential, leaving it to the producers? Um, yeah, I think I think when it comes to recording, just from my experience, I, I think it's mattered less because there's so much emphasis on recording amps and putting them in super dead room. Sure. You know, they could be in a closet, all those early Bad right. Religion albums. You know what I mean? Like blankets all over your closet, closet type thing, yeah. or just like soundproof to shit, you know what I mean? Or treated to shit, rather, mm-hmm. to the point where the whatever's subtleties, coming out of the yeah. back of your amp is just hitting, you know, a bunch of foam somewhere. So mm-hmm. like, it doesn't really matter. Have you ever recorded with an open back cabinet and put a mic at the rear of it? No, but I have seen a video recently where they messed around with that and what a fantastic idea. Yeah, that it is. seems really cool, man. Yeah, it's a yeah. great way to just add some. It's like a little color kind 100%, of, you know. You know what I mean? Just to, instead of double micing the front or on top of double micing the front, throwing one in the back and seeing how that fits into, you know, the combination of, of, mm-hmm. of all three of those tracks as one sounding amp. Um, yeah. I think, that, I think that's something that everyone should explore because when it comes to tone, period, as a general idea, I'm firmly in the camp of... 80% of your tone comes from your cabinet and the speakers that are in it. That's the hill that I'm going to die on. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Man, it, it matters. It definitely 100%. matters for sure. Yeah. So, I don't know if I would agree with your percentages, but it <laughs> fucking matters for it's, it's, sure. I mean, maybe 75%, 15% maybe from the pickups and then like 10%. From your, like, the other, like, arbitrary things like style and, and picking and, and things like that. But, man, I think the vast majority is the I, cabinet. Yeah. I would give it no less than 50%. You know, we could fight <sighs> about this later. But it yeah. is a big port. 
50 percent's a big deal dude you got to put yeah the guitar your tone woods if you believe in such your pickups mm. your all that your pedals that takes up the other 50 percent yeah so i'm saying that sure. at least 50 percent is taken up by yeah. a cabinet cool. you know yeah then i mean we're in the same ballpark then, for because sure. it's definitely it at matters. least 50 percent it yeah, matters yeah, yeah. dude yeah. i think it's sure. i think it's so much higher but yes you know you can't make a fender sound like a mesa rectifier you know well let's do some sick mods that's how <laughs> yeah. the mesas were sure. made yeah, but absolutely. for sure but yeah. you know so yeah we could probably argue till the cows come home about yeah. the percentages but yes we'll man. fight later dude yeah 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 so that's so cool. like um i'll just bring up a specific example like i know you went in the recent single that you guys did with hard pipe hitter third world america you went and recorded with asteroid m records mm -hmm. um with uh cody shout out to cody and asteroid m records shout out to cody sure. and asteroid m records he does so, a fantastic um, job the guitar tones on that um and it's a two guitar band i know you got mm -hmm. diego over on the other guitar but what was your approach to that one um it, did you come in with your carbon did you use yes i know he has a buffet of amplifiers he does and we use that buffet i think we used um the jcm 800 as the head cool and then um at my request because of how firmly my feet are planted in yeah. my ideology of, of tone and yeah, speakers for sure um i told him I really don't care about coming in and using, even on my cab, I, I'm so in love with my speakers. I almost didn't want to introduce the variables of miking cabs into the streamlined process we had for recording because we were so sure. ready to record and ready to just get the song out. And because of how I feel about tone and speakers, I just told him and I asked him, do you have enough IRs yeah. for me to go through the different speakers and to find my tone? He does. And he does. Yeah. So that we can just use your JCM 800 and throw up the list of, um, IRs, which for anyone who isn't familiar is, um, like a digital, uh, imprint of a speaker. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we just ran that JCM into his interface and I went through the, uh, the speaker cabs. Of, I believe he has that two notes wall of sound where you can like pick how close the mic is 100%. on the cabinet right. and which, which, the room size, which for me, and how I feel about speakers being the key component yeah. um, and the cabinets was perfect because sure. I knew exactly what I wanted it to sound like because I know what my rig sounds like. Yeah. And so I was just like, pull them up, dude. And we found the one that was closest and I was like, move the mic a little bit this way. Let's find it right here. Boom. There it is. That's, and we just yeah. went, you know what I mean? That's great. And so that's, so you were using a modeled 800 or an analog 800 into the sort of load box cab sim. It was a load torpedo. box cab I know sim. he's got the torpedo uh, captor X, I believe. Right. That's what he's rocking um, on that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think he had some sort of, uh, yeah, like program on, on the computer, but yeah, we went for analog JCM mm -hmm. into his program where he was able to load in his IRs and move the little, yeah, I love that placement. method. Like you have the tactile knobs that you would want out of your tone controls, like with right. a physical amplifier right. and again, can eliminate the variable of microphones, microphone placements, or not necessarily eliminate, but you streamline it in the program, you know, cause these IRs, they don't, they don't fuck around nowadays, you know, right. like they are definite top dog things. Yeah. And going through different rabbit holes of home recordings and tone and settings presets, which I hate the idea of most of the time, you know, I had learned and have a process now for how I set up a tone, not just for recording, but just in general, mm -hmm. which, um, uh, is a top down approach when it comes to the settings on your amp of starting with the presence knob and then moving to the treble and moving lower, mm -hmm. but doing that actually last because, uh, you should be starting, in my opinion, with picking your cabinet and getting the, the, the sound as close as you want and then picking your microphone placement, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, to get uh, where on the cone you want to have, you know, your fullness or, you know, your the proximity effect of ha being deeper by just moving the, the, the microphone a little bit closer. Yeah. And then with everything at 12 o'clock, you know, when you have the closest ballpark from your cabinet and where the microphone is, you know, or simulated microphone. Yeah. Then go to your amp, analog or digital, and uh, adjust the EQ starting from presence and moving down. The database. I feel you. I have a weird, uh, like, an interesting way of, uh, I guess, like hitting that EQ because I like line up with you right at, at, and set everything at noon. You know, you give the chord, 
and then I'll go through. I probably go from the bottom to the top now that I think about it. I'm going to have to try that top-down approach for sure. But I'll start with like a bass chugging on like the low E and then take it from noon and kill it back to zero. And then just essentially sure. start rolling it on as I'm chugging until yeah. I feel it hit my soul. Yeah. And then I'll move to the mids and I'll kind of use the D and the G string, just kind of chug it on those right. and roll it in until it hits my soul again. And then same with the treble on that. And then I go hit the presence. But you know what? Sometimes I be ripping people's faces off with presence. So I feel Absolutely. like and as guitar players, down, we do that yeah. a lot because it's like if we're not feeling it, if it's not hurting our ears when our face is right in front of it, then it's like, well, and we all have the, tinnitus. Yeah. Just turn the presence so, up a yeah, little bit. Yeah, for sure. So, no, I feel you. I'm going to have to try that uh, top down because I don't know. I'm just always since I was a little kid, just started with that bass mid. Mm-hmm. trip you know for sure yeah, I, I, I like love that it. that's it, great something i picked up from um shout out to this youtube channel it's chernobyl studios i think this guy teaches people how to set up digital recording you know at home nice, and going man. through like setting up you know your 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 digital amps and your sims and stuff and that idea just made so much sense to me because it's really just a matter of like like you said, hitting it to zero and then from starting from the presence, getting it to where not where it hits your soul, but rather where you have enough of it that you're like, oh, it's there. Yeah. And then moving there. You know what I mean? For and sure. And then once it's all there, then slightly tweaking and turning your, your, your volume up as you need to, to for it to hit your soul. And yeah. And focus on the tone more first than like this response of just like, oh, it hurts. So now it's good. Let me move to the next one. For sure. Yeah. Then, no, I like that, man. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, well, I guess we're wrapping this down. I have a, a final question mm-hmm. for you. This is a desert island question. You're on a desert island, and you get one guitar, one pedal, and one amplifier. It can be a head and cab, you know, split up, you know, it's all good. But one, one, and one, what's your choice? That's difficult, man, because, man, whew. Take your time. We can edit out the pause. Yeah, I know. It's, it's a, that's a very philosophical question. Um, my... Gut instinct mm-hmm. is to think that if I'm stuck on an island, mm-hmm. um, and let's discard this issue with electricity, right? Because sure. you said no. If, yeah, if, they have if, definitely. If there's a plug somewhere in a rock, no, we're running you 120 volts for sure, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, somewhere, we got yeah. you. I would have to think that, from a practical sense of just being the only one there and having to play music and be happy with the sounds that I was yeah, making for you, that I would I would have to have some sort of cutaway nylon string acoustic guitar oh yeah okay and maybe a small just small little acoustic amp with some you know i guess if i had to have one pedal it'd probably be a tuner pedal that's what's up dude that's, <laughs> you, that's know what I mean? you know you're real if yeah. that's if your answer is a tuner um, pedal yeah <laughs> uh, so because in that situation where maybe i'll never see a, another person again and I have to be happy with just the songs that I'm playing. Mm-hmm. At, and you're going to die. As the, so, yeah, I mean, yeah. As with just one instrument and no accompaniment. Mm-hmm. The idea of using an electric guitar with no accompaniment, accompaniment sounds so problematic because yeah. you'd be writing songs for an arrangement for the most part. You wait for long enough, band. you will have a drummer in your mind. Totally. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and, 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 you know, start to get creative with like the tapping things and maybe playing clean and whatever. But as far as just like full yeah. rich bass sounds and having the full spectrum of frequency responses from just one instrument and one person on an island, I think I would have to have a beautiful nylon string guitar. I feel that. I feel like that answer speaks to your whole philosophy of tone, you know, yeah. like a nice full, 100%. round, yep. pleasing tone, you know? 100%. Yeah, man. All right. Well, I mean, we can cl- let's close this out with uh, any links that, like, you may want to plug for any bands that you're in or projects. I know you have uh, some endeavors, so to speak, that you are a part of. So let's just shout yeah. those out real I quick. Mean, uh, just from a personal level, uh, I've been actually mixing podcasts recently as hey, income yo, and shout doing out. AV stuff. So if you need um, help with AV things or mixing podcasts, let me know. I'd be happy to help. Um, musically speaking, if you like hardcore punk rock, old American hardcore, please look up Hard Pipe Hitters. If you're into like Foo Fighters, Blink-182 type, you know, pop punk or alternative rock kind of stuff, uh, Sprockets is be- mm. something you might want to look up. And then um, Cat Calling is a fantastic artist that I have the pleasure of playing with very often. And she's... Uh, got some wonderful songs and deserves to be a lot bigger than she is right now. So, And you also have a company 
um, doing uh, merch for a lot of artists and uh, screen printing. Uh, is that, yeah. yeah, so I have a screen printing business called The Cotton Mafia. And, Shout uh, out Cotton Mafia. If you are mm-hmm. a band or an artist, even a tattoo artist of some kind, some sort of creative here in Las Vegas, and you need T-shirts or stickers or just merchandise, uh, you need merch. Everybody you needs do. merch. You do. And I you have got a YouTube strong channel. opinions you on, need merch. on how people should be selling You sell their muffins? Stuff. You need merch. Yeah. You need it. But yeah, so we have a fantastic band deal uh, for shirts and stickers. Shoot us an email at thecottonmafia.com um, or hit me up online and I'd be happy to help out and get you some shirts and, and, and at a cost where you can still make money on top of, of paying me to, to do what I like to do, which is play music and, and help bands and stuff. Beautiful, man. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Well, thank you, man, for coming down and giving your time and drinking some coffee with me and uh, hope to have you again sometime to talk about other tone endeavors. I look forward to it. All right. Thank you.